everyone. Uh, when the Mishnah in uh, the 10th parak of Pesachim goes through the halachic structure of the Seder, and it does not give us a precise text of the Haggadah, but it tells us that the way the Haggadah has to be formulated is, the, is by incorporating an element that is called maschilin bignus umesayim bishvach, which literally means you must begin the story by describing the degradation, the suffering, the adversity of Klal Yisrael, and only then do you culminate in the praise of God redeeming us, meaning you can't just begin with the good part of the story. You have to begin with what is called the bad part of the story. Now, there actually is a machlokas, an argument in the Gemara, what do we mean about the bad part of the story? According to one opinion, it is avadim hayinu, the negative part is the slavery in Egypt, and the Haggadah is viewed as the narrative in which we move from slavery to freedom. According to the other opinion in the Gemara, the negative is an earlier stage that before Avram Avinu, our forefathers were idolaters. Mitchila, ov de avodazara, hoyu avoseinu that originally our forefathers were idol worshippers, and then Avram Avinu brought us to belief in Hashem. So these are two different paradigms as to what is the story of the Exodus. Is it going from slavery to freedom, or is it going from paganism and idolatry to monotheism? Now, those of you who remember the text of the Haggadah actually note that we incorporate both references in the Haggadah. We both have the avodim hayinu aspect, which emphasizes slavery, and mitchila of the avodah zara, that emphasizes our origin in paganism and idolatry. And the truth of the matter is, this is a composite of two different view, uh, two different views of how the Haggadah should be constituted. Meaning, there was a version A of the Haggadah that emphasized slavery. And there was a version B of the Haggadah that emphasized the transition from paganism to monotheism. And our Haggadah is actually a composite of A and B. In fact, there are Talmudai Chachamim, there are scholars who have tried to identify as they go through each paragraph of the Haggadah, which paragraph is derived from version A and which is derived from version B. But be it as it may, I want to focus in a more general way on what is the specific significance of beginning with the negative and culminating in the positive, why can't I just begin with the positive? Why can't I just have a party? Hey, God redeemed us. God gave us freedom. God gave us the Torah. Why do I have to start with how bad things were? So there are a few different ways of learning it. A simple way of learning it is that it is the nature of the human being that we often do not appreciate the goodness of God unless we recognize how difficult things were. You know, a person often does not appreciate health until, sadly, they go through sickness. Uh, a person does not appreciate freedom unless they've gone through oppression. Uh, those people who have parents uh, who sur either survived, or grandparents who survived the Holocaust or who came from the former Soviet Union or who came from repressive environments where you didn't have political and social freedoms, or who suffered anti-Semitism, when they come to the United States or any free country, uh, they tend to become much more patriotic because they appreciate freedom much more than people who were born into freedom. We take it for granted. We're spoiled. So one might say very simply, in order for me to appreciate that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us the freedom of Yitziat Mitzrayim, I got to remember how bad it was. So one could say, I need the before in order to appreciate the after. That's a simple answer, and that's a perfectly valid answer. But there's one very strong difficulty with that answer. I'm grateful to God for taking me out of Mitzrayim because I, I, I re-experience how bad and bitter the slavery was. But here's the problem. Who is the one that put me into slavery? It's God himself. God told Avraham, your children will be enslaved in a land that is not theirs. Now, it's true. 
that God's original decree was 400 years. And God had mercy because we were assimilating and he took us out after 210 years, but he's still the one that put us in. I mean, imagine if somebody threw me into a prison cell, locked the door, and then after 210 years, assuming I'm still alive, opens the door and says, you're free. Am I going to feel gratitude? It's like, you know, God forbid, it's like Hamas releasing some hostages and saying, be grateful that we're releasing you. Well, maybe I'll make believe I'm grateful because I don't want anything to complicate my release. But in my heart, I'll surely be thinking, you shouldn't have taken me prisoner to begin with. So how can thinking about the slavery generate a greater sense of gratitude to the Almighty if it was God himself who put us into that difficult situation? So the answer has to be a much deeper and profound understanding of beginning with the negative. It is not simply a matter of remembering how bad things were so you appreciate the redemption. Rather, on a deeper level, we understand that the slavery itself is part of the redemption. That the blessing of God is not only in the liberation, but the blessing of God is in the slavery. Meaning, if freedom simply would have meant, right, we were free, we were slaves, we were free. If the freedom after the slavery was simply putting us back to where we were in the freedom before the slavery, then in effect we would have a big complaint. Hey, why did you make us slaves? But if we understand that the freedom after slavery is qualitatively different because of the slavery experience, and it wouldn't have been the same had we had the freedom before the slavery, then we understand that the slavery itself is part of the growth. The slavery itself is part of the gift. The slavery itself is part of the redemption. So it's not remember the bad so I'm grateful for the good, but it's understanding that the so-called bad has a hidden divine light of goodness even within that. Well, let's be practical. What does that mean? In what way can I look back at the, not the exodus, but at the servitude in Mitzrayim as something that gave us benefit? There are different things you can say. I would just suggest two very quick answers. You know, it's well known from uh, the, the uh, Gemara that even though the Jewish people in Mitzrayim had reached a very, very low level the 49th level of impurity. And if you hit the 50th level, you're a goner. Uh, you've reached a point of no return. And that's why the Arizal says God had to take us out 190 years early, after 210 years instead of 400 years, because we were about to hit the 50th level of Tuma. And even the statement, we didn't have time to let our dough rise and we had to bake it as matzah. Those few minutes, we don't even know what that means. Those few minutes, we would have hit the 50th level. So the truth of the matter is, the Jewish people were idol worshipers, except for the tribe of Levi. The Jewish people didn't practice bris milah, except for the tribe of Levi. Four-fifths of the Jewish people, in fact, did die in the plague of darkness, because apparently they hit level 50. So we were in a pretty bad shape. We had to be redeemed then, either then or we would have disappeared. But the Gemara says there were certain residual merits that we had that kept us afloat. Yeah, they didn't make us sadikim, but they kept us, they kept our head above water so we were at level 49 instead of level 50. Now what the exact list was uh, differs from different parts of the Gemara, different Midrashim. But the basic idea was we didn't change our language. We spoke Hebrew. We didn't change our names. We kept our Jewish names. According to one Chazal, we did not speak Lashon Hara against each other. 
we, 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 we were united, we were together, we didn't intermarry, we were modest and chaste in our sexual relationships. All of these were zechuyot, which kept Am Yisrael alive. Now, these were not from things. These were not religious things. When they didn't speak Lashon Hara, it doesn't mean they were learning the Chafetz Chaim. I mean, they were idol worshippers. The obvious they weren't from. But these were indicia of Jewish unity, Jewish identification, a sense of peoplehood, a sense that we were one. And even if we were not religious in a from sense, but that was a great sechus that enabled our redemption. It was not the purpose of redemption. The purpose of redemption is that we should get the Torah. But it was the beginning and the indispensable root of redemption. Because without that sense of Jewish identity, Geula cannot start. A person is irredeemable unless they consider themselves part of Am Yisrael, the nation. It is actually the sense of Jewish peoplehood. These are my people. I rejoice in their joys, and I suffer in their sufferings, which is the shorish, the root of redemption. And that eventually brings a person to God as well. But without that sense of being part of Am Yisrael, the person cannot have a relationship to God. So the long and the short of it is that the zechus was we didn't assimilate. We kept our language, our names. We didn't intermarry because we regarded ourselves as an amichad. But there's a problem with that. The Gemara says that after Yosef died, the surviving Jews said the following. If we are so loved by the Egyptians when we are separate and we keep our own distinct ways, how much more so will we be loved if we simply assimilate and become like the Mitzrayim? So the Medrash actually says that when Yosef died, B'nai Yisrael said, Niya kamatzrayim, let us be like the Mitzrayim. And therefore, God had to put hatred in the hearts of the Egyptians to ensure that we wouldn't assimilate, to ensure that we would be different, to ensure that we would be rejected, that when we try to become close and close and close, the goyim push us away. So wait, wait a second here. We have two narratives. We have one narrative that says we wanted to assimilate and become like the Egyptians. But then we have the other narrative that says we precisely survived because we were cognizant of our differences. We kept our names, we kept our language. So which is it? Were we trying to assimilate? Or were we trying to be different? So the Beis Levi gives a beautiful fundamental answer. His answer was, before the slavery, we were trying to assimilate. But if as a result of the slavery we realized that no matter how much we want to be part of that culture, we're never going to be accepted. That caused introspection. That caused reevaluation. In other words, this is what I termed in an article I once wrote, the hidden blessings of anti-Semitism. We don't want anti-Semitism. We don't want Jews to be harmed in any way, of course. But sometimes anti-Semitism is part of God's plan that when a Jew thinks they're going to become accepted by giving up what makes them distinct, Hashem will use the hatred of the Umot Olam to remind us that we have to be different, to remind us that we only have each other and Hashem. And we can work with the Umot Olam, and certainly Jews are productive in all endeavors of society, but we have to realize that we do have a distinct mission. So, to go back to the question, what was the blessing of slavery for which we're grateful? It was the slavery that made us realize that as much as we want to assimilate and become like the nations of the world, they're never going to accept us. And therefore, we must turn inward 
and create solidarity among, our, among ourselves. In other words, it was not the exodus that created Jewish unity. It was the slavery that created Jewish unity. And therefore we begin the story of our redemption not with the freedom, but with the slavery. Because the slavery itself forged Jewish consciousness, Jewish unity, Jewish community. We have to hang together, as Benjamin Franklin said in a different context. Otherwise, we will certainly hang separately. But there's another gift of slavery that God gave us. That is, the Torah says in a number of places that you should love the ger. Ger means convert, but literally ger means the stranger. Love the stranger. Take care of the stranger in your midst because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Let's listen to what that message says. A ger, of course, is a convert, but certainly at a time when wealth was mainly measured in land. A ger came to a foreign society. A ger came without resources, without family, without protexia, without connections. And he comes to your land where you're sitting pretty on your land and your government and your monarchy. And often when a person becomes successful in life, they may forget their origins and not bother to think about the less fortunate. What does the Torah say? Remember, remember, remember. Remember there was a time in your collective history when you were a slave, when you were oppressed, when you were a nobody, when you were insignificant, when you were humiliated, and use that memory as the source of empathy and compassion for others who are suffering in the place where you once were. This is a remarkable statement because what it says is, you know, Chazal tell us that one of the identifying markers of a Jew is Rachmanim, to be compassionate, Baishanim, to be humble, Gomlei chasadim, to want to engage in acts of loving kindness and mercy. That is endemic, that is intrinsic to the Jewish soul. But what is the source of that? Where does that come from? The truth is we have two sources. One, it goes back to the Avos, particularly Avram Avinu and Sarah. That was mashrish, they rooted in our personalities, caring for others wanting to help others. But there's a second source that feeds this river. And that is the experience, not of Yitziat Mitzrayim, but the experience of Avdus Mitzrayim. We were slaves. We were poor. We were downtrodden. We were vulnerable. We remember that. We remember that pain. We remember that humiliation. We remember that suffering. But instead of becoming bitter and angry and narcissistically preoccupied with our own self-protection, it is the source of our empathy and our compassion for the outsider. In other words, it's no accident that Jews were involved in civil rights and Jews were involved in even communism. I would, I would call, obviously, communism a wrong turn. And Certainly it was a system that was not deserving, but Lubavitcher Rebbe pointed out that many, he knew many Jews who were actually from, and they joined communism because they thought this was a way of compassion for the poor. So yeah, uh, Jews can make a lot of mistakes in how they assess that particular midah, but it comes from compassion, it comes from empathy, and that empathy in turn comes, at least in large part, from remembering the slavery experience. So to go back to my original question, I raised the question, why is it so important in Judaism that in the Haggadah we not only talk about the good part, the redemption, but we talk about the negative? Because the negative is part of the redemption. It's not just 
a bad thing happened and God took me out of it. But I recognize in the negativity, I gained certain gifts. I gained national solidarity, communal cohesiveness. But I also gained a universalistic aspect, even towards the non-Jewish world, of empathy and compassion for those who were suffering. These are gifts. These are gifts that came with an awful price, to be sure. These are gifts that came out of tragedies. But they are ultimately spiritual gifts. The lesson to us applies in every part of our lives, not just Pesach. In every life, there is adversity, there is challenge. This can often make us bitter. This can often make us lose hope. It can often make us lose faith, both, God forbid, in God and in ourselves. But the lesson of Avdut Mitzrayim and Yitziat Mitzrayim is we have to be able to see the redemptive potential even in adversity. We have to grow from our challenges. We have to become greater. We have to recognize that God's gifts come in many, many different ways. There are the gifts that are beautiful and easy to accept. They're pleasant and they're wonderful. And Baruch Hashem, in most lives, there are plenty of that. And then there are gifts that are burdensome and difficult and hard to deal with and understand. But they too are gifts. And in the larger scheme of things, they may be the most precious gifts that God gives us. I wish everyone a Chag Kosher V'Sameach. May Pesach open up the channels of redemption and Yeshua that Klal Yisrael needs. May Pesach be a source of redemption for each and every one of us as individuals. Hi.